It's on? Okay. Test, 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 test. It has all you are needs in it. Okay, then. And that's the audio adjustment. Okay. And his name's not up on the deal, so you didn't expect him to come. I guess uh, Brandau couldn't find Visalia, so he decided not to come. So anyway, I'd like to call this meeting to order. And Mr. Crocker, you want to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? item is roll call. Director Brandau. Director Crocker. Here. Director Magsig. Present. Director Mendez. Here. Director Pacheco. Here. Director Shecklian. Here. Director Vanderpool. Present. Okay, so we'll move to item four is approval of the agenda. <coughs> so moved. We got a motion. Second. Second. Call the question. All in favor? All right, you got a vote on the uh, screen there. That's all right. I don't want to say it anyway. Aye. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Pass 6 0. <-0>, okay. <laughs> With one absent. <laughs> so uh, now we'll move to closed session. Yes. <laughs> I would not start without you. Let him die. You mean die? Does Larry don't do that for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, with that, uh, we'll move to public comment and I have two people that requested to speak. I think <laughs> this is on stuff not on the agenda. Are they here? I have uh, Laura Hernandez. Good morning, members of the board. Good morning, I'm very happy to be here because I've read your agenda items, so I'm very excited to be here, just so you know. Good morning, my name is Laura Hernandez and I am a child support specialist and have been the count with the county for the last 17 years. I'd like to start by sharing my experience with the current healthcare benefits and how it has impacted my family. For years, I've had to struggle, like many of my Tulare County colleagues, who simply have not been able to afford the extreme high cost of out-of-pocket costs for co-pays and coverage. Countless times throughout my career with the county, I've had to choose between seeing my doctor for health concerns or verifying how many flex dollars I had available to pay. As a mother, I've had to think twice about whose health is important. And as you know, this is what the current system has done to many families like mine. As a committed county employee, we deserve the right to protect the health for ourselves and our families. We know that this is not a simple fix, but we are committed as employees and members of this community to work with the county and the SJBIA to find solutions to these challenges. Today's recommendations being presented by the SJBIA broker for approval is a step in the right direction. And it is important to note that as employees, we do appreciate the county's initiatives 
to address these challenges. Specifically learning yesterday that the CAO had approved about $2.5 million to ensure that county employees had health insurance. Very grateful for that. I, along with my, county, my coworkers, encouraged the SJVIA board to approve their recommended renewal rates and plans for Tulare County while also requesting a commitment to continue working diligently with us to address the out of reach healthcare costs that will continue to impact working families. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Uh, we have another request from Sabrina Ramos. Hello, my name is Sabina Ramos and I'm an employee of Tulare County for the past 18 years. I'm here today to support the recommended approval, renewal rates and plans for Tulare County presented for approval today and recognize that it's a first step in the right direction to help support the health needs of Tulare County employees. While the proposal demonstrates progress to lower our costs, many of our coworkers have taken the hit for years on their financial burdens due to the cost of the current $1,000 deductible with a $45 copay. There still needs to, to be more done. We need to find a common solution that benefits the health of Tulare County employees and their families. My personal story is I too am a mother and I have had the opportunity to have my husband's insurance, which covered so much more than the Tulare County plan that we had in place. My husband retired from Fresno County and the health insurance was not that affordable, so we got out of that. And then I had to put my husband on my own personal insurance and it was like almost 800 and some odd dollars out of my pocket per paycheck to get coverage. And the thing is, is the plan that's going to assist um, me is because I still have my husband on my health insurance. And yes, the thousand or hundred dollar per pay period is going to assist, but still it's going to be over $400 per paycheck that I'll still have to pay. But anyways, again, um, again, is we can just find a common ground to help the Tulare County employees is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to speak at this time? Good morning. I guess my voice carries a bit better. <laughs> Definitely. You're not like in Fresno. A, uh, yeah, no, I'm not in Fresno right now. I'm not in Fresno anymore. Right? Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, my name is Riley Telford. I'm here on behalf of Fresno County employees as a elected uh, leader, chapter president of SEIU Local 521. Um, we're here to stand in endorsement of uh, the recommendation for the rate parity uh, for Fresno County. Uh, in keeping on with the EPO plan and the uh, Kaiser plan uh, renewal. So um, we feel that this is definitely a, a step in the right direction uh, as employees were facing options of maintaining coverage uh, or access to doctors that they currently had. We had other proposals that we looked at reviewed as far as the HVAC committee. Um, and we felt that for employees at large that Having the rate parity with the EPO gave the best option for employees to maintain care with their current providers, as well as looking at the cost uh, associated with uh, employees that are trying to find the best dollar coverage and make sure that they can now pick coverages that best meet their needs as opposed to their expenses. Uh, we know that health care continues to be an issue uh, for both counties, Tulare and Fresno County, as well as uh, other entities within the SJVIA. And we definitely appreciate all efforts by the SJVIA board and the various uh, county uh, entities um, of trying to address those needs and concerns and trying to help uh, rein in the cost of health care for employees. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? 
And with that, we'll move to the next item, which is approval of minutes. Second. Chair. I got a motion and a second. All in favor? And who's against? Seeing none, the vote passed 6 0. Thank you. Now move to item eight director's questions and announcements. So, a chance for the bloviators to bloviate. Do we have any bloviation here? <laughs> With that introduction, no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, we will move to item nine and Megan Marks. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the board, good morning. My name is Justin Pratt with the auditor's office. I'll go over cash flows, um, projections for uh, the remainder of the calendar year as far as and where we are currently. Um, for cash flows, we only have about five weeks worth of uh, data to report on uh, since our last meeting. Uh, you can see the, uh, we had a uh, high amount of uh, um, inflows coming in at the beginning and uh, kind of took a dip uh, downward with uh, annual expenses coming in, insurance renewals, and uh, increased expenses. So it kind of took a dip down, but it's uh, leveling back out. Our high so far this year was um, in, as far as uh, Cash in our Chase Bank and our investment pool is about 16 million with a low of 11.8 million, approximately. Um, this is attributed to um, the dip is kind of uh, a bit above average from uh, our daily PPO and paid claims. Uh, we projected a daily payment of about 160,000. Right now, for this year, it's about 193. So it's a little higher than average, but we expect it to kind of uh, uh, level out as the year progresses. On the uh, next slide, <coughs> you'll see that. Uh, into a kind of uh, return to a more of a normal uh, projection. So at this point, <coughs> we're still on uh, normal uh, for the remainder of this uh, calendar year. Any questions on this? The roller coaster is more normal, correct? I'm sorry? The roller coaster is more normal. Yeah, you get that big dip downward before you go back up and around yeah. some, some more. So. It's expected about this time of year, but things are going to level out as the year progresses. Okay, any, any other questions? Well, just a general comment. So again, when you go back and you uh, look back multiple years, the cash position of SJBIA has continued to improve, and uh, uh, you don't see anything on the horizon that would indicate that our cash position is going to move uh, into uh, a negative position in the foreseeable future, correct? No, and then the uh, next uh, item, we'll talk over the cash position from the last uh, fiscal year, and it's continually to improve. Uh, uh, this last fiscal year, we saw a um, dramatic increase in our cash position. And uh, so far for this year, we don't see any reason to believe that that, that trend will not continue. Okay. No more questions, we'll move to item 10. And I see Megan's got you doing that too. Exactly, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Again, Justin Pratt, Auditor's Office, going over the, um, this is the uh, fourth quarter results, basically how we entered the uh, fiscal year 2019. Uh, these are our unaudited statements. Um, as you just mentioned, uh, cash balance in our Chase Bank investment pool came to about $12.4 uh, million with a uh, improvement in our net, net deficit position of about $200,000 as opposed from uh, last quarter. Uh, the next slide shows how uh, our budget for the year versus our actuals for the fourth quarter, we had total receipts of about 27.93.9 million and disbursements about 27.7 million, which end of the year, um, our what we projected for being received was actually 2% better than what we expected, and our expenses were also 2% better than what we projected initially. So uh, <coughs> on the next slide, so for our administrative costs, 
Um, we had some more uh, legal services that we were classified into litigation. We were kind of um, separating out, the reason for the item in red, we were separating out what we were um, expenses from county council versus um, outside um, uh, legal services being provided to us. So we ended the uh, year with a total um, administrative costs of about $1.3 million. On the uh, next slide, goes over our entire cash, cash position from the entire uh, fiscal year 2019. Uh, you can see that we began the fiscal year with about $7.3 million in cash, and we ended the fiscal year with about $12.4 million in cash. And that is it for this item. Do you have any uh, questions? Any questions from the board? Hearing none, we'll move to item 11. And item 11 to present is our um, auditors from Price Page and Company to go over the um, audited financial statements from 2017. And Marie will be uh, passing out copies of the uh, 2017 statements to you guys. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Osvaldo Gutierrez. I'm an auto manager with Price Page. And this is Larissa Murren. She's an auto senior that pretty much worked on the majority of these statements. Uh, we're here to present the 2017 financial statements. Um, there was a delay for numerous reasons, but regardless, we're back on track and we're going to proceed with the 2018 audit ASAP. Um, you should all have <coughs> financial statements in front of you. Um, just as a general idea of what we do. We do a lot of planning and coordination with the authority to get all the information that we need to provide an opinion on these numbers. So on page one and two, you see our main auto report. Overall, there's no, um, no issues. It's a clean opinion, which is the most important thing of what we do and why we do it. On page four, you'll see the main balance sheet, statement of net position, and this goes over this similar data what uh, which is spoken about earlier, except these are numbers are for 2017. So you'll notice that the majority of the balances are held in cash and intergovernmental receivables between the counties and the related deposits and liabilities. So the biggest items to note are going to be for the unpaid claims and the unearned member contributions that comprises about $10 million, $11 million of the liability shown on this. So with taking everything into consideration, there's still a negative balance of, or a deficit balance of $15 million in the unrestricted net position. And that has to do with just a simple formula that there's more liabilities than there, are, than there are assets at this time. On the next page is the statement of revenues and expenses. Pretty straightforward, all the contributions on top for all the, at the time, the cities and the counties. And then with the related expenses, most of them of course are the claims and then the admin portion of the expenses comes out to a net effect of uh, negative or a deficit of 5.8 million for this specific year. So with this entity, the way it's structured, it's an insurance provider and um, operates as the authority for these counties. So we have to show the total revenues and the administrative portion. So in effect, it is different the way it's presented, but it, in actuality, this, these are the numbers of what's really going on. So that's what that is. Page six is the cash flow statement. I will not bore you with that, <laughs> but essentially all the cash payments are received by area of where the money is actually going. And note, the notes of the financial statements describe all the significant account balances and all the detail of what these numbers are. Um, a lot of that is standard information. There's nothing too, um, I think, too complicated. Page 11 does show a lot of the uh, reasons and uh, descriptions of what those liabilities are, in case you're interested of why those numbers are presented the way they are. Um, and of course, page 13 shows the claims liabilities, showing the beginning balances, all the incurred claims, all the payments, and everything related to get to the number that you see on the balance sheet. So a lot of these notes are informational only because it does show you the detail of what is needed to be presented and why. Um, Long-term liabilities on page 14 primarily consist of the loans that the counties 
loaned out to the authority for the operational purposes. Um, so $9 million. And page 15 is a required disclosure regarding the risk management of the entity. So it does show you all the related limits and the deductibles for each type of coverage, um, just informational only. And pretty much as of July, there's no subsequent events other than, of course, the, the cities that are no longer part of the authority worth disclosing. On page 18 and 19, this is supplementary information, the claims development information that shows a summary by year of the related revenues and expenditures so you can kind of get a historical trend and analysis of where everything was back then as compared it is to the current year. Um, so you can take that information as you see it. Page 22 is, or 23 is our standard internal control report. So with every audit that we do, we work with um, the authority to make sure that there's nothing that we see when we do our tests and our analysis that if there's an improvement to internal controls that are needed, we bring it up. Obviously, we don't review 100% of every single dollar through the door because that'd be impossible. Otherwise, we'd be there all year round. However, we do our inquiries and analysis and testing throughout the whole audit to get to this. So these reports are boring looking, I know that, but they do have a lot of weight. So be, we are adding our signature to this page, and we, to the best of our knowledge, don't see anything that is glaring. And then the last page is the summary of findings and responses. Um, no issues with internal controls or no material weaknesses or anything that we want to report to you. Um, so there's a lot of legwork that goes into our audits. We have a lot of documentation to fill out, and we as a firm are held to a lot of standards through GASB and uh, the accounting standards nationwide. So there's a lot of work to get to these reports. Um, but otherwise, we didn't have any difficulty working with the team. They were very helpful. So we just want to commend them for giving us everything that we needed when we needed it. Um, so be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, any questions? Go ahead, Nathan. Kind of a general observation. Sure. <clears throat> and again, this is a snapshot as of June 30th, 2017. Correct. And I think it's very much uh, appropriate to point out that the previous presentation gave us a snapshot of where we are as of June 30th, 2019, which is unaudited, and okay. this report that you did takes a look at where we were two years ago. Clearly, the net position two years ago, we were bleeding cash, you know, 15.4 million upside down. As of June 30th, 2019, we're now 3.4 million upside down, which is $12 million to the good, we still have more work to be done, yes. but I really need to commend our staff and uh, my colleagues here on the board uh, to turn something like that around in a two year period is, you know, takes, uh, it's a Herculean effort. But just for the public, it's never good to have a negative net position, but I just wanted to point out that from 2017 to where we are now, um, there are uh, some pretty significant improvements to our, our net position. Sure, and that's a good point. Um, that is a very big swing. And realistically, when we get to that fiscal year, I would put a lot of emphasis that the number probably won't change too much. So you can kind of count that as like your number that you need to use. Obviously it's unaudited, but based on the information that we get, normally that's pretty, the number is what the number is. It, there's only so much you can do to change it and reasons why. But you're working on the 18. Yes, we're currently working on the 2018 audit, so hopefully we can get that done sooner rather than later so we can get back on track to finishing the 2019 audit. Alrighty. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move to item 12. And that's uh, Gordon. Good morning, Gordon Darm with Keenan, uh, consultant to the SJVA. Uh, I'm here to present the June experience report. We had a, another uh, positive month relative to uh, surplus accumulation. Uh, through June, we had medical premiums of about 40 point, uh, called 2 million, uh, which exceeded costs of 38.5 million giving us a surplus position of about a little over 1.6 million on the year. 
uh, based on a 95.9% total loss ratio. Uh, the dental plan, uh, we self-funded that this year, such that if there were surplus accumulations during the course of the year, we could actually take advantage of that. And through June, uh, as you can see, we've got about $200,000 that has come in-house. Now, a majority of that is going to fund the IVNR for that. Um, so going forward for the next six months, any margin accumulation will truly be margin accumulation. Uh, the vision plan remains uh, fully insured. However, we do ex receive experience reports. It's in a minor deficit position of about $10,000. So not significant there. Uh, I will draw your attention to the uh, to the chart on page five. And this kind of shows you 2019 budget to actual. I just want to re uh, uh, refresh your memory that we we're going to try, uh, try to accumulate about 4.8 million in reserves this year. Um, so far, uh, we are at about uh, well, just under 3.2 million in reserve accumulation. That's about 65% of the way through 50% of the year. So we're, we're ahead of track. We're very hopeful that, that the balance, 1.6 million, we can accumulate between July and the end of the year, uh, putting us on target. Should we hit that target, uh, what I'm hoping to be able to report to you at the end of the year is uh, twofold. One, we'll have IBNR, it will continue to be fully funded, and we will have a one month stabilization reserve in place. What that then leaves uh, the SJVIA with is 2020 and 2021 to uh, accumulate reserves for the repayment of loans. And uh, so we're on track with, with that schedule and uh, I'll entertain any questions relative to the experience reports. Any questions? No questions. All right, great, thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll move to item 13. Okay. <coughs> um, as we've done over the past several years while we've been your consultant um, for June 30th of each year, we've had an actuarial certification of the IBNR. Um, and I'd like to introduce Christine Huff from our Keenan office. She is our actuary. She's the one that prepared the re reports and the calculations, and he, she's here to report on that. Good morning. My name is Christine Huff. I have been with Keenan for almost 14 years. And prior to that, I was with Mercer and Towers uh, Watson. And um, I have calculated your reserve, um, the plan's reserve, as of June 30th. So the IBNR reserve is basically uh, the amount that the plan must set aside to pay the um, unpaid claims liability. And I have used uh, one of the accepted methods in the actual field, which is Born Hutter uh, Ferguson. And the reason we pick this method is because uh, studies uh, shows that this is the method that produces the least amount of standard error. And so based on uh, this method, I have calculated um, the reserve for County of Fresno and County of Tulare as shown on my letters that I have certified. And um, I certified that this is the amount that I think would be sufficient to pay for the unclaimed liability as of June 30th. And uh, on my letters, I also uh, recommend recommended that you put the uh, margin and the accepted margin in the actual field to, to cover for uh, uh, fluctuation in claims will be between 10 to 15, and I have used 15% in this case. So, and I more than said that you, you will determine whatever margin you need to apply later. Any question for me? Any questions? Thank I'll, you so much. Yeah. I'll just uh, state that at the, earlier this year at the February board meeting, we uh, the board uh, made an election to set funds aside, and and that amount was uh, $6,652,000. Um, and that included margin accumulation, 
uh, at this point in time, the, rec uh, the uh, actuarial calculation was 6.9 million, 6,924,000, uh, which also includes the dental. Uh, so an additional $272,314 is required in order to maintain fully funded. And, and um, that makes it an action item to, if you'd like to move forward from this point forward, maintaining it, the recommendation would be that we take the uh, $272,000 out of the reserves and place them into the IBNR reserve so that we, as of June 30th, we're still fully funded relative to IBNR. Quick question, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. So again, I might have missed this. Um, the, um, on the agenda, it lists 273, 314. Fiscal impact, it's showing 272, 314. Staff report shows 273. Um, so is it 273 you're looking for, or 272, 314? So if you look at under the agenda, how it's posted, yeah. item 13, it says 273, 314. Two but if you look at fiscal impact, it's 272, 314. So it's just $1,000. I don't know if in the presentation that $1,000 was being taken out and used for something else, and I just no, missed it's, it. No, if it is, it's a typo. I, it's, I can tell you it should so be. So the true same. number is 272, 314 that you're looking for? Yes. To, to increase the IBNR by that amount. Yes. All right, just wanted to make that and, clear and, for the record. And to let you know, there's always, every year when we prepare the renewal, there's a component in there for what's called change in IBNR. Um, so we look at the current IBNR, we look at, well, at the beginning of the period, at the end of the period, and then we project forward. That differential can be plus or minus. In last year's, it was a plus. So we actually, reserve, within the rates, we reserved an increase in the IBNR. That is being realized in the experience report right now, and it, that's why I'm saying those dollars are built into, the, into this process right now. And so we're just saying that if you want to continue to have a fully funded IBNR, we would need to move those dollars into your actual funded IBNR account. Okay, so this is an... Is this an action item then? Yes. Okay, so this is. Uh, I'd move for staff's recommendations okay, for the 272, 314. I'll second um, that recommendation I've to the IBM got a Second. All in, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passed 6 0. Thank you. So now we'll move to, back to Megan Marks herself. Good morning, uh, Megan Marks, Auditor Controller's Office. Uh, we are requesting that you um, allow us to issue a 30-day without cause termination agreement or a letter to our um, previously contracted actuary. In April of 2017, uh, SJBIA entered into an agreement with Rallon Letson to provide these services that weren't previously provided. Um, being as Keenan and Associates is available and contractually, contractually obligated to provide the IBM, uh, incurred but not reported information and other information that we need to comply with GASB 10, it is, um, we find it to be in the best interest of the authority to uh, go ahead and stop working with Braylon Letson um, if you guys agree. Um, so with your approval, we will um, send this letter out that you have a copy of. Um, a very simple that we're terminating effective today, I'm sorry, effective September 23rd, um, and it will cause a reduction in costs of about $14,000, which is the actuarial services. Are there any questions? Any questions? No, if I, no reason to pay for two uh, actuarial services. I would move for approval second. of the recommendation. Okay, you got a motion and a second. Call the question. All in favor, so I'm saying aye or hitting the button. Any no's, hit the button, <laughs> and that passed 6 0. -oh. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> so and we'll move to item 15. You're back up again. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Gordon Darm, Keenan Associates. Um, this is uh, item 15 is the 2020 renewal. Uh, at the last board meeting, we presented the preliminary renewal and uh, the final renewal that we're presenting to you uh, was changed uh, in a couple of different aspects. We dropped the month of June 2018, picked up the month of June 2019, so updated the experience period. We also went back, looked at um, some of our calculations relative to margin, uh, IBNR, trend assumptions, and so forth. The net impact of all of those items is about a 3.5% reduction from the original self-funded medical. So, right, uh, so the cost projections came down uh, from that aspect. And I will say, uh, I'll, I'll uh, pretty much stick to the executive summary chart. Yeah, we'll uh, get better. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, and, and I will tell you that uh, we, uh, this, uh, the underwriting was done with generally accepted uh, underwriting practices. There are some blending of rates and so forth uh, between uh, several different uh, coverages uh, to come down to what uh, both counties and what w we felt would be the best interest for the city of Marysville as well too. So uh, affectionately, it's a combination of options three and two for um, the county, county of Fresno and County of Tulare was option three that they were looking at and option two for the city of Marysville. And I'll, I'll, the net impact, the EPO would go up 3.25%. That's substantially different from the 16.65, which was shown from underwriting. The biggest cause, and you heard public testimony relative to that earlier, was we are blending uh, for the County of Fresno. They'd like to see parity in their rates between the EPO and the Kaiser plan, meaning that no longer will it be an employee's choice to select a plan because one has higher rates than the other. The rates are gonna be one and the same. So both of those coverages provide the first dollar coverage. Um, there's pretty much parity in plan design as well too. So what we're hoping is that the uh, adverse selection that is happening every year where more and more people are going to Kaiser because it's less expensive will stop and people will make a choice based on what's best for their healthcare needs as opposed to what is best for their budget. So that's how we got that 3.2, down to 3.25. The PPO plan was, and the high deductible health plans were in a, were in a uh, significant negative uh, position. That's a good thing. They actually need about 30% rate decrease. We're proposing that uh, we just leave rates as they are at zero. Um, putting the overall to anthem renewal for County of Fresno at 2.71. Now, of course, the impact of the parity is on the Kaiser rates. And so that would cause an increase in the uh, Kaiser rates of 7.78%. But that basically means that those rates are one and the same. Um, on the dental, we're proposing uh, no rate change. On the dental HMO, which is fully insured, that's 4.33 to the um, uh, County of Fresno. And Vision is coming in, it says 1.98, it's 2%. Uh, and that's for a two-year rate guarantee. We're uh, insured as there as well, too. For the County of Tulare, um, we're proposing an overall 4.72% uh, uh, rate adjustment. There are some plan design uh, changes made to the 1,000 plan. And um, I will uh, make this disclosure, too, that uh, the rate exhibit in here shows uh, a, a differential in percentages because we originally applied the rate change only to one uh, to the 1000 plan and not to the others and the county of Tulare would like to have one common renewal at 4.72 so um, the rates will need to be revised that are in this exhibit so when it comes down to uh, board action we would uh, need a board action that allows us to modify that that allows us to modify those rates to 4.72 because that's not what's in your exhibit um, Kaiser would come in at a zero. 
Uh, the D Delta Dental PPO also at a zero uh, for uh, the county of Tellary. The DHMO is at 4.07, and the vision is at two, uh, making for an overall increase of about 4%. Uh, the city of Marysville, we had discussion relative to them. They are only enrolled in our medical program and in Kaiser and in, the, the, in their PPO and high deductible health plans. Uh, the underwriting showed a significant rate decrease. We're not going to do it because they're too small and uh, it's not substantial enough. And if they had one large claim, they'd have a substantial rate increase the following year. Um, last year, we gave them the average for the SJBI in total. But uh, this year, the recommendation is that we just leave it at zero for both Kaiser and zero for um, their self-funded medical plans as well, too. And that really um, uh, brings this uh, renewal that, to a close. I'll entertain any questions that you might have. Mr. Chair, I have a few questions for you, uh, Borden. Um, one of the things that I wanted to have you comment on is um, you, you mentioned in the summary that there is a 3% surcharge or margin for the county of Tulare and a 2%, I'm sorry, for the county of Fresno, and a 2% surcharge for the county of Tulare. That, that's a margin that you're, you're building into the rates. Right. Um, would you just may, maybe explain that? Because that's, yeah. that's a margin that's on top of what you're projecting for trended increase anyways, correct? Correct. So after we, uh, the, the normal underwriting practice is that we um, project claims forward using our trend assumptions and so forth. And then we apply a margin component uh, just like you heard on our IBNR uh, from our actual, we apply a margin component on there as well too. Um, one of the things that we did this year is we gave consideration for um, surplus accumulation uh, between, um, are, are the two counties equally br bringing uh, or proportionately bringing reserve accumulations up? And the one thing that we noticed was that proportionately the county of Tulare uh, was bringing more of the reserve than the county of Fresno. 3% uh, still being the accurate number here, but we kind of did a, can we allow the county of Fresno to just have 2% margin in and allow the county of Fresno to proportionately catch up by leaving it at 3%? And that 3% is also on Kaiser. Um, Delta, uh, the Delta Dental is 2% in general because it's dental coverage, doesn't need that much. And so that was the impact of that, that uh, we felt that we can still, one, achieve our margin requirements for next year, um, which are going to be about $4.5 million, and still uh, allow, a, uh, hopefully, to kind of right the ship a little bit relative to proportionate ac accumulation of margin between the two so, groups. So you got to the three and the two, and you explained that, but we didn't have on item 12, which kind of talked about the uh, plan experience, we didn't have any information that indicated uh, total premiums paid in since the SJVIA uh, was incepted all the way through today. Because I think that when we look at the reserve accumulation, we need to be considerate of the fact that um, wh where is the County of Fresno's position, where is the County of Tulare's position, and are the, are the two carrying their fair share and, and paying their, uh, their weight? So. Uh, for example, if you look at since inception and in, uh, County of Fresno is in surplus, then maybe their margin should be reduced. And say County of Tulare is in deficit, maybe our margin should be increased. You, you did that for uh, the, the current period, but, but let's look all the way back to and, and look at what has been paid in. Um, as we are setting these rates, I just want to make sure because this is, this is sort of a plug number. Um, and, and we could actually, you know, say this board decided, well, a 1% makes sense for uh, Tulare based upon the actual uh, since inception, uh, and a 3% makes sense for the County of Fresno, or vice versa. Um, have you done that, that calculation? Not in conjunction with the renewal. That calculation is done typically uh, once a year, and it's presented at the beginning of the year in, in February. Um, and I think you bring up a very valid point because um, we can use that, calcul that calculation at that time um, 
to basically set the parameters for the next renewal. Um, so we have it well in advance, not in conjunction with the renewal, but in advance of that. Um, and you're absolutely right. This came about because of the disproportionate accumulation, and we said we, we need to right the ship. So I think um, I didn't want to include it in every um, uh, every experience report because one, it, it's a little bit more complex, yeah. and two, I want to make sure I'm working with the auditor's office and um, <laughs> making sure that we kind of agree on the numbers. And at that February board meeting, we kind of that's where the where. If you'll note on, on my reserve accumulations, there's always that disclaimer subject to the auditor's uh, review and confirmation. Um, at that uh, February board meeting, we will have, time, have had time for the auditor to meet with us to confirm what the actual reserve accumulation is because my uh, reports that I have are ba based off um, projections as to what SJV administration is going to be on a per employee per, per member, uh, a per employee per month uh, estimate. And that can vary, there's a lot of other variables that can vary. The auditor is gonna have the more exact number. So my, my preference moving forward, if it's okay with, with the board, would be that we use that calculation that I do from inception to, to most current, which will be 2000 through 2019, to then say, okay, based off of this, looking at what we need to accumulate, Margin uh, setting should be at these levels. And I do want to mention this as well, too, that at the end of the year, it's projected that we will have a stabilization reserve completely funded. That is typically what mar margin is used for, for stabilization, um, in the absence of a funded stabilization reserve. So um, if there were no loan repayment, the margin would be zero. Mm -hmm. um, but since there's loan repayment, that margin going forward is not for necessarily for claim fluctuation. It's a vehicle to capture loan repayment. Yeah, and, and I, I get that. I know that we need yeah. to uh, work towards that goal. I just want to make sure that we're uh, being equitable. Um, you know, County of Fresno is a, a bigger uh, workforce, and uh, County of Tulare is a bit smaller. And I think that the experience from inception till now uh, is an important thing to uh, consider yeah. and to look at. And then also just to, to comment on uh, some of the increase uh, for the County of Tulare, uh, you hinted at it with the uh, plan design changes, but you know, what, one of the things that's been a, been a real burden for uh, Tulare County employees is the $45 copay, for example. Um, and that goes from 45 to 25. Um, that has a cost to it, but you look at uh, you know, the decreased deductible, the decreased out-of-pocket max, um, We've done quite a bit to uh, address the various issues that have been raised by our, our employees over the year, and it's we, we are fortunate to be in a position uh, as a county and as an SJVIA to look at that and to do that, um, and I'm very supportive of uh, what the County of Tulare has brought forward, and I think it does show a commitment on the part of the county uh, to making sure that health care costs are reasonable for our employees. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Just a quick comment. You can't let it go. I can't let it go. So a um, couple things. First, as we sit as the SJVIA, clearly we are a separate entity. All the board members up here, we have the interests of the SJVIA um, at heart. Other hats that we wear, one of them being we sit two as boards of supervisors of respective um, counties. I want to uh, echo my colleague um, to my right here, Pete, his comments about uh, making sure that there's equity in all of this is important because we need to make sure that no one partner is unequally yoked. So for SJVIA to have longevity, it's important for there to not only be trust, but that all partners uh, pay their quote unquote fair share. And if one entity is contributing more to reserves in this case, that needs to be recognized and um, the other participants in the SJVIA need to pay their fair share, or the entity that's overpaying needs to get some type of uh, credit or recognition for that. So it's not just blended and lost in the mix. Thank you. I would say if it meets the board's um, request, like I mentioned earlier, if we could um, do that calculation when the year closes, that way we have, we. we because what we do is we take into consideration all adjustments 
that are made up and beyond what my reserve calculation is. Um, we'll have time to meet with the auditor's office as well and say, here's our findings, and then report back in the February board meeting. And I think that's an excellent time um, because I'm hoping one board action will be that you'll say, we're gonna set this amount of dollars away for a stabilization fund, and then that gets parked into th that account. And uh, the second action item could then be as well as, as we look to 2021, that we look to uh, adjust any margin accumulation to, because technically it's loan repayment that we're working on, and it's, it's in recognition of what the past has brought that we set those at that time, and I'll come up with a variety of options relative to that as well. Okay. Thank you. Is, this is just a, uh, we don't, this isn't an action item. No, th this is an action item today. Yeah. Is there any public comment on this item? Hearing okay. none, I'll... I'll move for staff's recommendation. And I think we heard from some of the public already stating their support, different representatives from uh, Fresno and Tulare uh, recognizing these uh, rate changes. We appreciate your comments. Move for recommendation. Okay. Chairman, if I could take one moment. I'm sorry. I, I, for one thing that I wanted to do and, and mention and remind the board that the one component that we don't have finalized today is always the reinsurance. Uh, the reinsurance is projected at a 15% rate increase. Um, with me, I have Orlan Ferguson. He is the reinsurance specialist for Keenan, and um, he will be working from now till the end of the year. Typically, it's the December board meeting where we decide on the reinsurance levels, but his task will be to manage that level below the 15%, and I will, I'll let him introduce him. Hi, how are you doing? I'm Orlan Ferguson. I've been with Keenan for 27 years. Um, as you can imagine, a um, lot of experience in regards to excess loss insurance. And um, like Borden said, it is a projection and we market your case every year and shop for the best rates for you. And we will continue to do that. 15% um, is just based on where we're at at this year and the claims that we're seeing. Um, actual market leverage trend is 21%. Um, so we're well below that right now in regards to our projection and we're looking to um, be below that at the time we're final with the renewals. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Uh, I'll second if the, uh, if we'll take an amendment that I think we wanted to add for County of Tulare to go back and do the 4.72 across the board. For all, for all of their self-funded yeah. right. anthem rates, yes. Correct. You fine with that? You made the original motion. I'm okay with it as long as staff is well aware of that and already working on it, so not a problem. All right, so all in favor? Or against, press your button. <laughs> we'll vote for you. Okay, in which the motion passed 6 0. Thank you. So now we'll move to item 16. Rhonda? Good morning. Rhonda Schustrom, SJBIA manager. Um, item 16 is a request to approve the agreement with life saving images. <coughs> which has been the vendor we've been using um, for our on-site mammog mammographies. And so it's a request to approve the agreement and authorize the president to sign. Um, the agreement that we had expired as of June 30th. And so this would extend um, the agreement from July 1, 2019 through June 30th of 2020. Um, our cost per mammogram for screening um, is $137. And when I say on site, that is um, where we bring in um, the bus um, to the location <coughs> and or bring in um, uh, nursing staff um, and staff that do the actual uh, screenings. In 2018, um, the County of Fresno had 105 screenings performed, and County of Tulare had 154 screenings performed. And we are looking at dates in the fall to do our next round of mammographies. Mr. Chair, yeah. just a quick comment. I, I really want to uh, compliment staff uh, and our employees for being proactive uh, and taking advantage of this uh, this service. I think it's very valuable. 
Um, and you know, I, I commented to my uh, Fresno colleague over here that uh, County of Fresno had 105 screenings um, and the County of Tulare had 154 and they have a significantly larger workforce. So uh, obviously we're doing something well in the County of Tulare in terms of getting the word out and our employees are taking advantage. So uh, being proactive with one's health is uh, one of the best ways we can control the future of this entity and keeping our premiums down. And I, <clears throat> I just want to add also, I think, you know, of course, getting your yearly mammograms are, are so very important for women and to have the bus right here. I mean, I have used it the last two years. We get busy, we, we put things off, and I know too many uh, women who have done that and then have uh, ended up being diagnosed with breast cancer. So um, with that, I would uh, move for approval. Amen. Motion to approve. I'll second the motion. Okay, got a second. And really, you did multiply. Okay, I want to call the question. All in favor or against, press your button. <laughs> oh, wait. Whoops. <laughs> and what's the motion? Pass 6 <coughs> I Just before we get to my favorite part of the meeting, I just, and I'm sure she knows, men are subject to breast cancer. All I, I do know that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Get a prostate bus or something yeah. coming over here too. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Check into a prostate bus because that is important yes. too. Yes. <laughs> Very good comeback. Thank you. <laughs> okay. With that, I'll uh, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Are we? Okay. So we're adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>